you. Do you need this? Ah, that's what I thought. Okay. Good evening. I would first like to thank the organizers for having me presenting what we're doing at the Letterkunde Press here in Antwerp, because I'm a, a local. So the presentation is split up in four parts, and I will start right away with number one, how I got there. When some 40 years ago I set up my private press to try to publish the results of my historical research, little did I know at that time it would come to this. The first publication I bought was Printing for Pleasure by John Ryder. In those days, printing with a relief press using individual type was still a very economical way for a private person to produce longer texts in somewhat larger quantities. The process of relief printing, letterpress, being the result of what Gutenberg, as I believe more in the role of a midwife than of an inventor, had brought together from already existing techniques, was still valid and the materials were very obtainable. I wanted to be a duplicator like Gutenberg. At that time, the industry was walking away to photocomposition. Little did I know when I bought my first rack of type that it came from a commercial print shop specialized in setting business cards. It contained many nice fonts, but very little type in each font, which is the downside of analog type. You have what you have. Looking for material to set my matter, I tried to buy from printers who were at that time unwilling to sell. But with the coming of the internet, everything all of a sudden came available. Being still under the impression that everything was rare and hard to get, I just bought and bought. And before I knew it, <laughs> I had a master collection of material which made that the actual printing never happened up until a few years ago. What did happen over the years was that I started to collect in a more structured way although some friends don't agree with that. And I expanded my collection to typecasting equipment, a specific part of the whole letterpress ado I thought to be most in peril. I was thrilled by it. And I can express it best with the words of John Baskerville in his 1758 Milton, when he described what he felt about letter founding. The innovative technology of this typecasting, and mostly in the 19th century, will also be a large chunk of my recently started PhD. One aspect of typecasting, making faces, as the famous film documenting Jim Rimmer's life is called, is the making of matrices to cast type. And then you quote Carter, type as something you can pick up and hold in your hand. Besides the Imprimerie Nationale, which was then a very closed institution, there was the Type Archive, aka Museum in London, which is focusing only on monotype, there was actually no other institution involved except for the Dale Gill Type Foundry in New Jersey, which was run by Theo Rehack. The knowledge surrounding that technology had been researched and described in many good publications. The practice of it was disappearing fast. I mentioned here South Hall and Wilkes, and of course the yesterday mentioned Le Gros and Grant, which I did read from cover to cover, but also not in one go. When I ultimately had the opportunity to acquire the equipment of the Dale Guild Foundry, the direct descendants of the greatest US type foundry, the ATF, American Type Founders, including their matrix making department, I was in the possibility to become a practitioner of this craft. In fact, I only did to follow Fred Smyer's advice in Counterpunch. If you want to know about these things, you have to go and make them but not punches in my case. I was interested in engraving matrices directly. It also makes me responsible to preserve it and make it available to others, and I'm not alone in that, as those who attended the workshops will have seen. I started to visit the remainder of what once were the great type foundries who were often turned into active or most of the time static exhibitions. The Tarp Archive and in Darmstadt there is still some founding going on. And for trying to understand the typographical punch, I inscribed for an intensive training at the Imprimerie Nationale under the professional guidance of Nelly Gable and Annie Boussel. More people here have done that. En outre, I attended a private tuition with Stan Nelson and had a meeting with Signor Bracchino, the former so-called last punch cutter at Nebbiolo in Taloni's workshop in El Pignano. For the specific knowledge regarding matrix engraving, I'm in close contact with experts who became friends, like Theo Rehack, there on the left, 
who learned the disciplines and protocols from the old masters and Ed Rea from Swamp Press here in his studio, my primary tutor and practitioner of the craft on a daily basis. Alas, they could not be here. A lot of inspirational support comes from institutions and organizations like the Association of European Printing Museums, who from the outset of their existence were involved in preserving the intangible heritage. I'm proud to be on their board as treasurer and thus help to preserve the heritage. You should all join. I have to do my job here. With my organization, Project Letterkunde, I also organized micro events, and this already is the third one. And this year we had Theo Rehack featuring in the shop to see and help us out with certain problems. Which brings us to the core of the talk. What are we making? We're making matrices. Now, South Hall mentions there is a producer and a designer. At some point, they were one, but we can't go into that now. We are concerned with the former. Matrices for casting type as a three-dimensional object were historically made in three ways. You all know that. Striking by using a punch, electrotyping by using a character master or a matrix, or the direct engraving of the matrix. For this presentation, I momentarily had the idea to come up with statistics about how many faces and designs were made using any of the shown ways. But I had to give up. Fact is that before any new method arose, punch cutting was the only way to go. Either using the traditional copper mold and steel punch, or any punch, and for instance, sand for a mold. The incunabulists still haven't figured out what really happened in the 15th century. They likely never will, because the only proof are the books from that era. So the, the first way is engraving a punch, ou la gravure des poinçons. It's usually prime in all historical research regarding typefaces. This conference hosts most of the world's leading experts and practitioners of that method. But however interesting hand punch cutting can be, because I have this engraving equipment, I decided to focus on that method. Now, one can engrave a punch, the mat or the type itself. So let's start with the latter, wood type. Wood type or any other kind of large type, the favorite material used by present-day letterpress people, designers and aficionados, are usually engraved from a solid piece of wood. Not all, of course. They can also be cast from other substances than type metal using an injection mold made out of metal or sand or whatever. I'm thinking here of the blocks that P22 makes with Richard Kegler or Daffy Kuhne as demonstrating casting his plastic type. You can also use a scroll saw to cut the contours of the type and glue it on a block, making veneer wood type. That method was also used with all kinds of materials to make patterns or templates for the engraver, in which I alas cannot go into. What you see here is not a veneer pattern, but it's an electrotype pattern from American type founder. And it's, well, I can't read it, Nicholas or something. Visiting Editore Taloni in Alpignano a few years ago, we also found that they used the Benton and Signor Bracchino to operate it to cut sorts in brass. They ran out of capitals and they just filled the cases with brass type, which was directly engraved. The second big way, I said, was electrotyping a, a matrix. For electrotyping an analog piece of type, you need that the that method spread wildly from the mid of the 19th century. But you need a model. Some call it a character master, like Southall, or a matrix. That can be an existing piece of type or a new design. The new design will have to be cut as well. The Germans call it Seuchnit. Seuchnit. And cutting that model can be done by hand or again using a pantographic engraving machine. And then finish it off by hand or not. When Karl there went to visit Enschede, as in his film, but if you read the book, you will see that he was asked whether he wanted to learn engraving in steel or in a softer metal. Electrotype, electrotyping, however, was never very popular with printing or type historians, maybe because the history of type was prompted with romanticism and punch cutting has romance written all over it. You just think of Koch, Hammer, and what happened with the doves and prints. Electricity and acid baths, they're not very romantic. Another reason could be that electrotyping lies at the basis of easy copying, legal or illegal, of some other type founder's design. Now, lack of time needs to force me to skip the method and go to what we actually want to talk about, engraving a, directly a matrix. On the right is the Benton engrave, on the left is my punch cutter's bench, which I haven't used much because I 
I'm focusing on that, but it still is my intention somehow. And I also will have to skip the history of the Benton Benton Waldo machine by lack of time. Now, engraving a matrix, it's important. It started with engraving punches the machine. One too quick. Uh, and that was needed for the mechanical setting of type with linotype, monotype, monoline, and so forth, because punches break, and only very skilled punch cutters are able to reproduce identical punches over and over again. It's also very time consuming, costly, it makes entrepreneurs too dependent on craft people. A nice example, for instance, is of not of irreproducibility is the Duff's type after they were thrown in the Thames, Emery Walker asked Prince in the early 20s of the century to cut the stuff again. And he tried, but Prince couldn't do it because likely he was too old. And engraving a matrix is not easy. From a technical point of view, mechanically engraving a punch is far more straightforward than a matrix. The problem is the face of the type, that what actually prints. So let's go and hear what a contemporary witness, P.G.W. O'Lee, has to say. He wrote a book, and I'll translate, in the foundation of the company called Type Foundry Amsterdam, previously known as N. Tetero, written in 1908. And I think the document is published and is just as or almost as important as Fouché or Moxon. In there, he informs us, after meticulously describing how to make a model for electrotyping, that some time ago the firm bought an engraving machine made by H. Bernard in Germany, which is used in German foundries to direct engrave matrices. He adds that they are very useful for engraving all kinds of things, like stamps for wax seals, but not for matrices. He says, we just cannot manage to engrave the face of the type in such a way that it is as polished as a matrix by electrotyping. They found a way around it and engraved the matrix anyway, cast some type from it and then used it to top up the, the casts and use them in the electrotyping department. So any type made in such a way is three-polar, engraved by pantograph, topped up by hand, and then electrotyped. Hence my earlier planned statistics would fail anyway. And this is 1908, and Oli cannot resist to add that they really would like to find out the secret to be able to engrave matrices directly. Who did know the secret was Lynn Boyd Benton. He wasn't the first, but that's the history we skipped with his reduction-reproducing skewed gimbal engraving device capable of infinite horizontal proportional adjustment. That's how Theo Rehack described it. Likely only five original machines have survived. Two are being used, one here in Antwerp and one at Swamp Press. It made the company great. There are knockoffs and there are many standstill machines. This is a very bad picture of one in Korea. This is one in, the, uh, in Italy. And this is a weird one, which I would like, to, if anybody knows about this, this is a vertical, it's not a Benton matrix engraver that, that is somewhere in the French Museum. And it's supposed to have been used by Dubonnet and Pignot, but it, I can't find much about matrix engraving in France. Now, let's see how a typical cutting goes. First, you need to have all the, all the parts, There's lots of standards, cutting wires, and so forth. And there is a film, the previous owner, there was an intermediate that Mike Currier had the equipment in his hand and he made a film of how the process goes. I wanted to do it with still images, but nevertheless, I will show you this, a few minutes where he goes through the, the process of when you once have your, your template, how you then make an engraved matrix. I often wonder what Benton would think if he could see that over 130 years after he began to develop his engraving system, it is still being used to produce new metal typefaces today. Producing a matrix begins with cutting down brass planchets, deburring the rough cuts, squaring up the roughs with the fitting machine, and chamfering the edges with a mill bastard flat file. By manipulating the diamond impregnated grinding wheel and quill holder, the tool grinder is used to grind the cutting wires to the desired profile. As a cutting tool is being ground, it is measured with a tolerance of plus or minus five ten thousandths of an inch. To adjust the height parallel or size of the engraving, precisely machined steel standards measured in picas and smaller brass standards in thousandths of an inch 
are inserted into the gauge way to increase or decrease the range of the cutting head assembly, establishing the ratio from pattern to engraved matrix. The Benton engraving machine can also be adjusted to expand or condense the engraving stem weight by arresting or freeing the motion of the interlocking orbits of the cutting head. An accurate engraving is reliant upon a well-maintained quill. Any slop in the races or a worn out chuck or keyway will result in a poor finish on the face of the engraving and distortion of the artwork. Each quill is lubricated with liquid petroleum jelly several times throughout the engraving process. Being able to remove the cutting jig to clean out the brass waste and to check the engraving was a huge advantage over other engraving machines. The jig is so accurate that a broken tool can be replaced without needing to start the engraving over. Even when using a cutting slip that tells the engraver the leverage, points under the screw, cutting tool, and follower size, a tracing of the pattern must be made to check the height parallel and width of the character before engraving can proceed. Optics play an important role in modern type founding. The Pasteur era microscopes used throughout Benton's process are essential to making a perfect piece of type. Sitting down to engrave a matrix can be as quick as a couple of minutes for points and other simple characters to several hours for ornate designs. The first cut is made with a roughing tool and large follower. This cuts away the widest strokes of the engraving, making less work for the medium and finishing tools. Each pass removes about seven thousandths of an inch until the desired depth is reached. Counters are cut away to half the depth of drive to help strengthen the engraving and make the type eject from the matrix cleaner and easier. Using the finest cutting tool, as small as two thousandths of an inch, and a follower that can get into the thinnest strokes, the finishing cut takes the last thousandths of an inch off the face, making a smooth matte surface for printing. Before a matrix is ready for casting, it must be made to fit with the other characters. This is done by removing material from all the bearing surfaces of the matrix until the desired set width, orientation, and alignment are reached. Once a matrix has been fit, it is trimmed out around the engraving with a three-cornered knife and struck with punches indicating the maker, depth of drive, point size, and set width of the sort. The final step is to rub the finished matrix to exact height to paper, measuring with a depth gauge. Benton's engraving machine. Right, now I'll show quickly what actually happens. I also asked for this project, it's a Granjo ornament, which we'll come to in a second, Annie Bussell to cut a punch of the same ornament. So, on the right is the first cut, the roughing out, followed by the second cut, and how the punch proceeds very slowly, handmade. This takes like 20, 40 minutes, even less. That probably hours, maybe days. Followed by a third cut, you do normally a fifth or a sixth. You have a finished matrix you can cast type from. When the punch is ready, hand cut, after many, many hours, you still have to make your mat. This is what you need to engrave a matrix. This is the inside of an engraved matrix. You, just, you see the, the bottom is very flat, the printing surface. But to strike the mat, you have to use a punch driver. That's the one in the imprimerie. That's a hydraulic one we got from uh, uh, Fonderie Olive. On the left now, they switched, is the finished mat with a cast type. On the right is the bulged out, punched, mat that we made at the Imprimerie Nationale by hand. You have to finish it off. And where you finish it off? This is uh, a design of a cross. And Ed Rea has found that if he inc 
incorporates those two points on the top, which is a measuring point. They are also engraved on the mat, which you can use to measure directly from for the side and the head bearings. But that is a, a story for the new designs. Now, what do we do? We went, you, you know, I've all seen these boxes at the Plant and Maritis Museum. We went and picked out two Grand Jean ornaments, which were very well documented over there, and even in the new book, or the book from last year, two years ago, by Vervliet. And with the help of Guy Hutzewout, he told us that there were negatives of the smoke proofs that they were made in the 50s or 60s, which you can use as a model to print off and enlarge, take your measures. It says points, but of course this is pre-point size. You, but with the bent and head, you can align, align any, 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 any size of type. You make a large enlargement, of which you make a polymer, which is your pattern. On the left, on top, is what I asked Annie to do, not to use a pattern like below, which is with the transfer, like uh, with the rubbing of, of a smoke proof, because then you're actually not designing it on your punch. You already need to have a physical object to make the smoke proof to transfer it. When you design it like that, of course, with the engraver, you follow the pattern. That's what you need for the engraving. So on the right is a matrix engraved, on the left is the punch. The plan is to have them struck, make mats, and then compare where we get to. We can make any kinds of matrices, foundry style, monotype style, Thompson style, depending on the casting machine, and these are some types cast from those matrices. On the top left is the punch smoke proof from the engraved, and below are the prints of the engraved types. Which brings me to the conclusion. Pantographic Cutting of type is often somewhat encumbered with an odium. Thibodeau called the pantograph the final perfection in punch cutting, although in a 1926 catalogue of Peignot it was called the machine infernal. The film on Karl there at Enschede, we are informed that Reddish, the punch cutter, opposed the engraving machine so much he took it about bit by bit and threw it in the canal. And in the writings of Van Krimpen, a lot of opinions are to be found concerning the mechanical cutting of punches. But it's not the time or place for me here to revive the frying pan debate he had, which was also mixed with his worries about making good type being restrained by the monotype unit system. I'd just like to refer to Carter's article from 1937, Optical Scale in Type Foundry, where he stated that when the pentagraph first came into use, the tendency was to show off its marvelous precision, but that with all its advantages of speed and low-cost labor, they could do no more worthwhile than a hand cutter could do. But we don't need more than a hand cutter can do. We don't need the speed and anything, but we need the precision. And as the digital world is expanding, signs of awareness to return to the analog world are becoming more and more pertinent. The surge in the interest for letterpress and the revival of wood type might expand into the metal type. And one day, if we keep using it and don't make any new, we will run out of it. In spite of the revived interest in hand-cutting punches, the method was, is, and always will remain a very time-consuming labor of love. Not many will be around to be able to recut a punch identical to the previous one, to replace, for instance, a broken one, to strike a new matrix when the original is burnt out, let alone cut a complete suite of punches for a new design. For electrotyping a new design, you also need a 3D model. You can do a line block, but what are you doing then? When we look at the massive amounts of designs that have been made with the pantograph, either in punch or a mat, and what the Dale Guild has produced, there is, I think, an opening for the future. They managed to recut the P42, all 255 of them, for museum purposes. I don't like to call it revivals. It's, it's, it's keeping it alive. It, it actually never left. At present, there is Ed Rea at Swamp Press, who makes new designs in metal type. On the left is Baker by uh, Russell Murray. On the right is Liluk. It's an imaginary font that you can't read. And he cut Cherokee in three sizes. And on the right is Pilot Black, which was, I think, the winning design of the Fine Press Book Association inaugural type design competition. The competition was all about the hope that by building bridges between printers and young type designers, we might end up creating new material resources for the fine press community. And in order to push the boundaries even further, let the Kunde Press and Swamp Press embarked on an analog cutting of the Dove's type in monotype matrices. 
as proof of concept, the matrices were entirely made from a block of copper. Not to be making a revival, not to be commercialized, just to see what is possible with the machines. And I should add that I'm fully aware that new and other methods can be used to make analog matrices. Vector drawing, CNC machine, laser engraving, and the now so divine 3D printing. They all can make printing surfaces, and some have succeeded. Parnassia in Switzerland made a William Morris face. Jolie from the plantain was cut in six point in Greece, and Ziza in the Netherlands. Russell Murray even convinced the type archive to cut him a whole set of mats for a new design. But I think if the techniques were perfected in the 19th century by Benton and Gowrie and so forth, they're good enough for me. My aim is to keep the old techniques alive, just like punch cutting, to learn from them and teach with. And my involvement with some printing museums, I see that most of the historic relics can no longer be used or even manipulated without gloves. So what are you going to do? How are you going to research it? Well, Recutting historical designs, no revivals, and casting them in replica molds, or have the possibility to reset the texts with those types that come out of that, is the aim. Inspired by all this, Hugh McFarlane, for instance, reproduced the oldest hand mold in the world kept here in the museum. That part's the old one, that's the new one, which we aim to be using for uh, experiments or students or whatever. We will have to make specific matrices for them because it is a fixed mold. The registers are fixed. Now, to end my presentation, I just want to end with a quote from a book I just bought and read by Gerard Unger, and I hope that my theoretical and practical research can help achieve these goals. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you Patrick.